Good. It's been a blessed Sabbath, hasn't it? You sense the, the Holy Spirit? Such a... Just really thank the Lord for the, the message that we're able to share this morning. And I, I, I just pray that we will continue to search out the scriptures to know our Father uh, and realize the lies that we've been told uh, about him. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a tremendous... A tremendous journey from that moment in 2000, uh, 2001 uh, when uh, the Lord revealed to me, I just want you to know me and I don't want anything to come between you and me and how he's led me step by step. And uh, as Michael was saying, you know, for me this is, for, it's, a, it's a jubilee for him and it's a jubilee for me because this is my 50th year. Uh, and interesting, Lillian, that um, it was uh, the 28th of August... Uh, in 2007, when I handed the return of Elijah to my conference president, it was the day before my 40th birthday, and then I left Egypt. So it was uh, in the doctrine, in the teaching, so the worship of false gods. So it's interesting. Uh, I, I would like to share with you some, some of the joy that I have found in the Sabbath. Uh, and uh, we know that the Sabbath, for those of us who've studied, the Sabbath is the seal of God. Uh, and, of course, in the middle of the Sabbath is the word Abba. It's our Father. We're sealed with the Father's name. Uh, and uh, so this is a, a tremendously blessed uh, topic for me to share. And so let's kneel once again and ask our Father to, to speak to us. Father in heaven, we just thank you for your presence, present by your Spirit, the Spirit which reveals to us the Father and the Son. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you come and abide with us. I just thank you so much for your comfort and encouragement. We live in such a wicked world, but we don't experience one millionth of the suffering and sorrow that you and your angels experience. They see everything. We thank God we only see a small portion of what you see. And so I pray that as we, as we fellowship together here, that as our minds are strictly focused on you and your great love for us, that you would give us a message. Uh, our hearts are, are united in love as, at the thought of your great goodness. And as you have brought these five dear precious souls to be baptized, our hearts are filled with joy. And so we thank you for the words that you will give and that you will bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. I had both the privilege and the handicap of being raised in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The privilege was that I was exposed to many, many good principles. Um, I guess it's a bit like Paul where he said, I'm a Jew of the Jews. This I was, bapt I was born in the Seventh-day Adventist uh, hospital. I was raised in Seventh-day Adventist schools and all those kinds of things. And I'm, I'm so extremely thankful for the, the blessings that I've received uh, I'm a, a third generation Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, my uh, grandfather on my father's side received a copy of the Great Controversy in, in the Netherlands and he became a Seventh-day Adventist. My grandmother uh, never became a Seventh-day Adventist. And on my mother's side, my grandmother, she had been a Methodist and uh, she studied with the Seventh-day Adventist pastor for seven years. Uh, <laughs> took her that long to make sure she'd ironed everything out. And then one Sunday when she was in the Methodist church, she said to her children, next week we're going to keep the Sabbath. We're going to keep all the commandments of God. And I, I, I'm immensely blessed to have this heritage of uh, grandparents that have stepped out uh, against their culture, their tradition, and to step into this, this message. And both of my parents, of course, they chose to remain, even though they both had uh, parents that were outside of the Seventh-day Adventist faith, they chose to be uh, Seventh-day Adventists. They met at Avondale College uh, in Australia, the Adventist College there, and were married, and so uh, third-generation Seventh-day Adventist. My wife is a fifth-generation Seventh-day Adventist. Her great-great-grandfather was baptized by A.G. Daniels in New Zealand, uh, and... Uh, 
I don't know why I get emotional when I think about this, but uh, uh, Ellen White wrote about my gr- wife's great great grandfather, and she said that um, she said that he's true as steel, firm and sure. Boy, what a heritage! And so, uh, and that's the way that that's the way my wife reacts to the fact when I'm travelling for for months at a time. And she says, God's given you a message and you need to preach that message and the people need to hear it. And uh, even though it's tough for her at home, uh, and uh, she never flinches. And I'm, I'm immensely blessed. I'm immensely blessed to be uh, in that kind of a situation. And I, I, I say to you again that the, the strength of my preaching and my message and the things that I have come off the strength of the confidence that my wife has in me. She's never flinched. She stood by me when we lost our house, our car, our careers, everything within the Seventh-day Adventist church. She never flinched once. So this is the truth. Let's follow it. And so uh, I'm a blessed man. And uh, when we come to the book of Genesis chapter 2, our Father loves to bless. And so uh, I pray that in the time we spend together that what I share with you, that if it is a blessing to you, that in some way I can repay the tremendous blessing that I have received to be a part of the Seventh-day Adventist movement. It was a tremendous blessing for me to be an ordained minister of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I treasured that position. And so only those who've been in that position who have had to surrender it knows the cost uh, of what that cost to be able to to do that, to follow the Son of God. But uh, Christ, as Peter says, is precious. He's worth everything. He's the pearl of great price. Uh, And uh, I count all things but dung, save for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Uh, It doesn't matter. So we come to uh, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 3, and it says, And God blessed the seventh day, and he sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. This blessing that God put into the Sabbath... uh, is, as A.T. Jones says in 720, 1893, this is the presence of God. The presence of God is in the Sabbath. But isn't the presence of God in every day? Yes, the presence of God is in every day. In the cool of the day, God walked in the garden. Uh, and, but what we learn through the principle of the Sabbath, and this is what's so precious about the glorious truth of the Sabbath, is that there are certain times in which God comes closer to us than at other times. We feel an intimacy and a connection to God at sometimes greater than at other times. And all of us who live within families know that there are certain times that when you are together, you feel closer to each other than at other times. This is the way that life works. This is the way that it operates. And God has established a great clock in the heavens to show us those times when he comes closer to us. And to be a Sabbath keeper means that you believe that there are appointments in which God comes closer to you that you may receive his blessing. I mentioned the other night that what God put into the seventh day was the blessing that he put upon his son. This is what's at the heart of the Sabbath truth. On the seventh day, God said to his son, and God saw that it was very good. And he says to his son, son, this is very good. I'm so proud of you. You're an inspiration. And I, it's, the, it's the blessing. It's the word of a parent to his child saying, I'm really, really immensely pleased. You are a delight to me. This is a time to speak words of blessing. This is the, this is the spirit that comes into the Sabbath. Because in Exodus 31, 15 to 17, it says that God rested and was refreshed. And refresh, that word refresh means to be blown upon. Well, who was blown upon on the Sabbath? It was the Son of God. Who did the blowing? It was the Father. The Father blew His Spirit upon His Son. And as the Son beholds His Father, so the Son does when He blew His Spirit upon the disciples. He breathed upon them and said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. And that's what's so precious about the Sabbath. But growing up as a child, I was not exposed to this idea very clearly, partly because of my own stupidity, but partly because most, uh, as A.T. Jones expresses it, uh, I was exposed to a lot of Saturday keeping. It's a day where you can't do anything. It's a day where you can't do the things that you want to do. 
It's a day when you pray for the clock to go 12 o'clock so that preacher at the front can be quiet so I can have something to eat and go home. That's the downside of being raised in the Seventh-day Adventist church is that the Sabbath is a burden because when you are a child, you're under tutors and governors until the time appointed. <laughs> and so the Sabbath was a burden to me. Uh, I was in the Old Covenant and uh, my... Uh, frustration and boredom was simply a reflection of how I was looking at my father in heaven and uh, that it was a restriction. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. And so this is what God has put in to the Sabbath, his blessing. You are my beloved son. We know that when God spoke to his son 2000 years ago, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This isn't the first time that he said this. When we, when we understand the principle of invisible and visible, and I, I don't know if I've explained this. Um, when God created this world, did sin exist? Not on earth, but did sin exist? Yes. So when God created this world, there is gospel in the creation week. Have you read the book uh, Gospel in Creation by Wagner? And so uh, we have on the first day that God created light. God who commanded the light to shine in darkness has shined in our hearts in the face of Jesus Christ. Day one is expressive of the new birth, but we don't see where the light comes from. The spirit is speaking. But when we come to day four, we see that the sun and the moon appear Objects of light appear. The light, which was, you couldn't see where it was coming from, it appears. And this is an important principle, the one, what I call the one and the four principle. Because uh, God sp told his son from the very beginning, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But at the end of the fourth millennium, it becomes visible. You, you see the principle? The light becomes visible. It's a one, the one in four principle. Uh, invisible, visible over the one and four. Same, when you put a seed into the ground, it's not visible, but then it comes forth and it becomes visible. And it, this is just something that I, have, that I have observed. And so this blessing, this, uh, this intimacy between father and son, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, this is the spirit that comes to us on the Sabbath day. But God didn't stop. He didn't stop with just the Sabbath. I want you to notice in Matthew eleven twenty nine. Matthew eleven twenty nine. Well, twenty eight. Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus can give the, give us rest. Because he is in the bosom of the Father. He receives his Father's spirit. Because he says, I do always those things which please him. And because he is in that position, the blessing of the Father is upon him. And he has rest. He rests in the Father. And that rest he can give to us. And this is what the Sabbath principle is all about. So that word rest, when you plug that word in the Greek and you plug it into the LXX, the Septuagint in the Old Testament, it turns up in some interesting places. And it turns up in the seventh day Sabbath, Exodus 31, 17 or 15, it will be a Sabbath of rest. Come unto me, all you that are labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. It's the same word. So if, when Jesus says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, isn't that him, that, isn't that him saying, come unto me? If you come to him when he calls you, he gives you rest. This is the principle. Of course, we can come to Jesus at any time. But uh, we receive the rest when he, when he calls us. Now, when we look at... When we look at this word, rest, come over to Leviticus chapter 23... This word appears in a number of places. It appears in the seventh day Sabbath. And then when you read Leviticus 23, 
This same word that Jesus speaks about, it appears in the Feast of Trumpets, in the Day of Atonement, and in the, and in the Feast of Tabernacles. What's significant about these three feasts is that they all fall within the seventh month. So we see that not only is there the seven days, we have the seven days where it's one, two, three, four, five, six, and then on the seventh day, this, this Shabbaton, this rest comes to us where we can enter into the bosom of the Father more firmly than any other day of the week. But then we have, uh, as it e expresses here, and I'll, I'll put it down a bit further, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven months, and the seventh month has the same rest principle in it. So that through this, the, the, the language that's used here, this, the, the same pattern of the seven days is reflected in the seven months, so that you have a week of months, and it's following the same principle. Does that make sense? So when we come to the, the first feast... Uh, which of course is a seventh day Sabbath, we're familiar with that one. Then it says in verse 6, and on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. So each seventh day you have this rest principle. Then you have the feast of unleavened bread, which is seven days. The first day uh, the first day is a holy convocation and the last day is a holy convocation. But it doesn't use the word Shabbaton. And the reason it doesn't use the word Shabbaton is to create this seven, this seven months, to create a week of months, so that the seventh month is higher than the others. But the Feast of Unleavened Bread is still following the seven principle. Does that, does that make sense? So the Feast of Unleavened Bread is made in the image of the week. And you're following that principle. And as we'll talk uh, later on tonight, it's very, very, very interesting what's going on in the, in the Feast of uh, Unleavened Bread. Now, after the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we come to the, the, in the... During this Feast of Unleavened Bread, we have the offering of the first fruits. And it says, after the Sabbath, after the Sabbath, during the Feast, and that's the seventh day Sabbath, after the Sabbath, you start counting how many weeks to get to Pentecost? We count seven weeks. One, two, three, four, five, six, and there's another seven in there. So we, got, we have day, seven days, and then we have a repeat. Seven days, seven weeks, seven months. Can you see the magnification principle through the feasts? The seven days, seven weeks, seven months. But it doesn't stop there. You go to Leviticus 25, you have another a seventh year, the Shabbat of the seventh year. So we, we're counting again, one, two, three, four, five, six, every seventh year. Now this is where I want to share with you something. This is my personal experience and I was completely unaware of this. But if you follow from the AD 34, which is the completion of the 490 years of Daniel chapter 9, and you just start counting seven year periods from there. You go along, 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 and then you come to the year 1979-1980. It was in the year 1979 that I was first baptized. It was a seventh year following that cycle. I was baptized at 12 years of age. I was baptized into the church before they changed into the Athanasian formula. So that was a real blessing uh, before that Dallas statement came in in April of 1980. Uh, but what was interesting is that when I was 19, I experienced true repentance for my sins. And so in 1987 which is at the end of the next seven-year cycle, August of 1987, I was baptised again. Uh, first time I was baptised into the church, that was more of a confirmation, but it was still a, a decision I made for God. Seven years later, I'm baptised. Seven years later, I received my call into the ministry, 1994. 
Seven years later, I received my message concerning identity wars in a seven-year cycle, where there's a major shift in my life occurring in 2001. 2008 was where uh, was the next major shift in my understanding, where I uh, rejected the seven and eight, was where there was a rejection of the Trinity, uh, and it coming into the Father and Son, the book Life Matters was written at that particular time. 2015, this was the next seven-year period where I came into an understanding of the feasts and the character of God. Major shifts occurring every seven years to give this land some rest. You see the principle? So when I look at my life, every, every seven years there's been major decisions that have taken place in terms of ministry, in terms of message, in terms of all of these sorts of things. I'm interested, for, I've had other people talk to me about these, these cycles with themselves because uh, Alan White wrote excitedly to Stephen Haskell about the sabbatical year, about the seventh year, and said, there's a lot of light in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. We should be studying these things. Very, very interesting. When did she write that? That was, again, wasn't it? that was around 1900. I think that was around 1899, 1900 that she, she wrote those things. And uh, so uh, that, that's something that I have experienced in, in my life that I'm saying, well, maybe that's a coincidence. Really? Uh, it, it makes sense because when we, when we read, and this is, the po- this is the point, when you go to Leviticus 25, it says, uh, verse 4, but in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest. And wherever you read that word Sabbath of rest, you need to think of the Spirit of Christ that is coming uh, with that rest that we need for our souls. Does that, does that make sense? There's a fountain of spirit that's coming out and it comes out every seventh year. And this is something that, as I began to look at this, so we come into the seventh, the seventh year. And then what, what happens after that? What's the next major appointment after the seven-year appointment? Jubilee, which is seven times seven years. So you get seven times seven years, and then, uh, which is Jubilee. And then what's, what happens after that? The 7,000th the seven thousandth year, or, the, or the, that period of se- a thou- the last seven, you know what I mean? <laughs> the millennium. It's a period of rest, isn't it? So, uh, millennium. And how many is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. See all the sevens? It says in the book Spiritual Gifts that God's people should learn to number by sevens. Seven days, seven weeks, seven months, seven years, seven times seven years, and the 7,000 years. This is a fountain that is flowing out where the grace of God is, is coming to us. I, I don't believe that's a coincidence. And it's a, it's a reminder to us, if you come to me when I call you, that, that I, will, I will bless you. And so the other thing that has been interesting uh, to me is that when we look at the, the divine pattern, the weekly Sabbath is observed by the seventh day. And of course, the day is regulated by the sun. So the, the, se- the seventh time we see the sun go across the horizon is the Sabbath. So we, we measure the weekly Sabbath by the sun. And all of, the, all of the annual feasts are measured by the moon. Is there a divine pattern relationship between the sun and the moon? Is it, isn't it the light of the sun shining through the moon? So that we can, at night, we're looking at sunlight through the moon. So there is a source channel relationship between Sun and moon, is there a source channel relationship between Sabbath and the feasts? So when I accepted the Father and Son, I began to look, well, where is the divine pattern in all aspects of my life? This is what I was looking for, to see, well, well, what about uh, the Bible? Well, it's a divine pattern, Old Testament, New Testament, source channel. What about my life? Well, I was brought into this world through a source channel principle, my father and my mother. What about the Sabbath? Well, we have the seventh-day Sabbath. Where's the channel? Where is the channel principle? 
And so that made a lot of sense to me. The other thing that's really, really interesting is the sacrificial system. As I, I thought about the sacrificial system, that uh, when Jesus died on the cross what, when, and he was speared, what came out? Water and blood that came out. When uh, the Israelites had run out of water and there was uh, the rock that God said to strike, when they struck the rock, what came out? Water. What does the striking of the rock symbolize? The death of Jesus Christ. So there, there in that symbol, when you strike the rock, the water comes out. So when we look into the sacrificial system, what times is the sacrifice of the lamb being offered? Morning and evening, Sabbath, new moons, and the feast three times in the year. Second Chronicles chapter 8, verse 12 and 13. We just, thus saith the Lord. It helps, doesn't it? Second Chronicles chapter 8, verse 13. Or 12, then Solomon offered burnt offerings unto the Lord on the altar of the Lord, which he had built before the porch, even a certain rate every day, which is the morning and the evening sacrifice, uh, according to the commandment of Moses, on the Sabbaths, on the new moons, and on the solemn feasts three times in the year, even the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and in the Feast of Weeks, and in the Feast of Tabernacles. So this is when the animals are being offered. So this is when the rock is struck. This is when the water comes out. So the water is coming out morning and evening. It's coming out Sabbath. It's coming out new moon. It's coming out feast time, three times in the year. Does that make sense? Now, what's interesting about the morning and the evening sacrifice, if we come to the book, uh, is it Mark 15? I'm looking for the text. I think it's Mark where it talks about when Jesus was crucified. It says he was crucified on the third hour of the day, uh, 1525. And it was the third hour of the day, day when they crucified him. When is the third hour of the day? Six to seven is one, seven to eight is two, eight to nine is three. Third hour of the day. And at the end of the third hour, Christ is hung upon the cross. What time did Jesus die? Uh, what? The ninth hour of the day. It's, it's somewhere in here. That's, that's the third hour? 34, and at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And verse 37, and Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. So he's hung on the cross at the third hour, he dies at the ninth hour. Okay, so the amount of time between the sacrifices, the amount of time that Jesus was hung upon the cross was six hours. Okay, what's significant about that? How many days are there between Sabbaths? Six days. How many hours are there between sacrifices? Six hours. So there's a Sabbath principle that's coming to us every day, the morning and the evening sacrifice. Now, I want to show you something very interesting. It's in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 3. And these are, these are things that I've been experimenting with. So, huh, I want to test this out. How does this work? 2 Kings... Second Kings, chapter three, uh, verse sixteen, and he said, "Thus saith the Lord: Make the, this valley full of ditches. For thus saith the Lord: Ye shall not see wind, neither shall ye see rain. Yet that that valley shall be filled with water, that ye may drink both ye and your cattle and your beasts." And this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will deliver the Moabites also into your hand, and you shall smite every fenced city, etc., etc., and stop all wells of water. And then it says, verse 20, And it came to pass in the morning, when the meat offering was offered, that behold, there came water by the way of Edom, and the country was filled with water. When did the water come? 
the time of the morning sacrifice. That's when the water came. Is, it, is, it, is the Bible trying to tell us something here? In reference to when the water comes? It came at the time of the, the, uh, the morning sacrifice. Go over a chapter, chapter 4. It's the story of the woman uh, whose son had died from sunstroke. Uh, and she's going to go and see the prophet. And her husband asks her a question. She doesn't tell him that her son is dead. She's going to go and see the prophet. And what does, she, what, does she, uh, what does he say to her? And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, It shall be well. So what does that mean? They normally went to see the prophet on the new moon and the Sabbath. Why? Because that's when messages would come from God. And the new moon on the Sabbath, that's when the water was flowing. That's when the water is coming out, that these things occur. Uh, are you familiar with the, the song, uh, um, Silver and Gold Have I None? It speaks about John and Peter going up to the temple to pray. Do you know what hour they went up to the temple to pray? It was the ninth hour. I think it's in Acts chapter 3. Uh, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. Acts chapter 3. They went up at the ninth hour of the day and they healed this man. And it happens to be the ninth hour of the day that they heal him. Just a coincidence. Why does the Bible mention it? Why is it telling us these things? Is there something significant about this? Um, verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Why is he telling us this? Who cares what hour in the day it is? Well, maybe it's important. And then all these things start to happen at the ninth hour of the day. So I've been testing this, this principle. And on Sabbath morning, uh, when, when Ben and I were in Germany, I said, at nine o'clock, around between eight and nine o'clock at the third hour of the day, let's just have a special prayer. And we tried this a number of times. And uh, I just really felt a blessing in the spirit would come. The water would come down at, on the third hour of the day. And I'm not saying you, you have to do this. I'm not, try it out. Test it. Uh, the spirit of prophecy says that we need to have morning worship, morning and evening. I think if you have morning and evening worship every day, this is fulfilling this principle. But I just wanted to experiment with the, with the third hour and the ninth hour because that's when Peter and John would go up to the temple to pray was at the ninth hour of the day. Why not experiment with these things? I remember um, someone was saying to me, uh, we're talking about the, uh, the new moon and uh, he had calculated one day and I'd calculated something else and he said, oh no, I got the wrong day. I said, well, let's do both days. I want to get as much water as I can get. <laughs> I'm not worried about, about, about those things. I'm still learning. I'm still experimenting. But there's something here. And so we see in Acts chapter 3 verse 19. What does it say to us? Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When? Times of refreshing. Now, when it uses the word times, does that mean there's more than one time that there is refreshing? That's what it means, doesn't it? So, is there a connection to the Sabbath fountain when all this water is coming out? Seven days of the, of the feast, the, counting seven weeks to Pentecost, seven months, seven years. Is there a correlation here? Well, I've been testing these things and I have found a tremendous blessing. And uh, it's, it's, been, it's been incredibly interesting to me. Now, I want you to think about something. 1844. It's in April of 1844. William Miller has said that Jesus would come sometimes between 1843 and 1844. It doesn't happen. So... Uh, they go scrambling. They go looking for, well, what do we do about this? And so they start to study about the Jewish calendar and trying to work it all out. In the middle, between Passover and Tabernacles, right in the middle of that time period, Samuel Snow produces an article called The Midnight Cry. And in that, he outlines the 2520, the 2300, the... Uh, the AD 31 date for the crucifixion, uh, the 6,000 year time period, 
uh, and, and a few other points. And what he references in there, that the Karaite Jews had the correct understanding of the calendar, which is to follow the barley, according to uh, Exodus 12 and a number of other places. This is all in the document called the Midnight Cry. When that was then preached in Exeter, New Hampshire, in August of that year, the Spirit was poured out with tremendous power. And they went forward in the seventh month movement. Why is it a seventh month movement? (laughs) Is this related to a, a time of refreshing? Why is God asking his people or drawing his people into studying out the calendar and understanding how to calculate the calendar? Why did they have to calculate the calendar to work out the day when Jesus moved from the holy to the most holy place? Does it really matter what day Jesus moved from the holy to the most holy place? Can't we just say 1844 was the year that Jesus began his work in the most holy place? Why did they have to work out the day? Could it be that it's because they had to work out the calendar? Is that the reason? I think it could be important. Now, when early writings, page 14, you know that the vision of the, uh, the narrow way which leads all the way to the heavenly city, she, in the vision, she saw a light... At the beginning, lighting the path all the way to the city. What did the angel say this light was? Midnight Midnight cry. Who gave the midnight cry? Samuel Snow. What was in the midnight cry? The calendar. The calendar lights the path all the way to the city. The cry went out at midnight. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. What was the difference between the wise and the foolish virgins? The wise had more oil in their vessels. Why do the wise have more oil in their vessels? Is there extra oil coming in the sevens? Because they follow the calendar? Have you thought about some of these things? So, uh, we have to ask ourselves, how does the midnight cry light the path all the way to the city? Have you thought what that means? Okay, we need to understand the 2300 days. We need to understand... These AD 31 and all of these things. But why did they have to work out the calendar? I believe the reason they had to work out the calendar is because, as we said in early writings, page 33, we received the Holy Spirit as we proclaim the Sabbath more fully. Does that make sense? As we proclaim the Sabbath more fully. What is the Sabbath more fully? It is the gift of the Holy Spirit that comes through the sevens. God's people should learn to number by sevens. This is what we have been told. And this is where we come back to what I said last night, where, to my surprise, the Spirit of Prophecy says that the wise should understand the Apocrypha, or that part of the Apocrypha that, uh, they, that was what she said was burned. This was a, quite a shock to me. And there's James White closing, quoting Second Esdras all over the place. Joseph Bates says, we should understand it. Second Esdras... What does it tell us in 2nd Esdras? Well, it says that God's people will be sealed in the feast. Have you read that? Why would they be sealed in the feast? Um, have you read Zechariah chapter 14? Zechariah 14. By, by this stage, what I'm sharing with you now is considered by most people so utterly, completely heretical that I just don't care anymore. Um, So read Zechariah. As I I say to people, I didn't give up my credentials in the Seventh-day Adventist Church to take one step out of apostasy. I want it all. I hope you feel the same way. So don't be afraid to study the Scriptures. And so... It says, uh, 14 verse 16, And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came up against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be uh, that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth under Jerusalem to worship the King, the, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. So is there rain connected to the Feast of Tabernacles? I'm going to share a little bit more about that in our next presentation uh, in in respect to the Feast of Tabernacles. So the book of Zechariah is telling us 
God's people are sealed in the feast. Why does the little horn power want to change times and laws? <laughs> Why? These are some things to think about. So as I'm looking out, everybody here, everyone's looking pretty tired. You've had a good lunch? <laughs> you didn't have the opportunity like me to go in the jacuzzi. <laughs> Should we stop now? <laughs> you want to keep going? You, you, you got some thoughts? Ben, I know Brother Bill is in a little... <laughs> So, well, well we, we'll come back this evening, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're good. You're good now. But can you can you see can you see the thought process? Do you understand the thought process? What it what it means? Oh, <laughs> Gary's doing exercises up the top there. He's waking himself up. So. <laughs> Do, we, do you see what it means that the Sabbath is the seal of God? Because it's during the Sabbath and it, and it comes to us every day. And, and some people say, I, I receive the Spirit every day. Of course you receive the Sabbath every day because the morning and the evening sacrifice is split by a six-hour period, which means you're still receiving a seventh principle every day. But on the Sabbath, it doubles. And on the new moon, it goes up four times again. And then on the... The, uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it goes up seven times again. And then at the Feast of Tabernacles, it just goes over your head. It's just massive. And the reason why God's people have not been able to accept this is because, as I've written in the book, uh, Augustine's Covenant Glasses, we've had a wrong understanding of the covenants. A wrong understanding of the covenants. And, and you have to ask yourself this question in regard to this dispensational system, when we say that the feasts only point forward to the work of Christ on the cross. So you're going to tell me that these people back here were engaged in ceremonies and sacrifice, ceremonies and days of worship that had absolutely no benefit to them whatsoever. It would all, they would be doing all these things for us and they would receive no benefit whatsoever. That's not how our Father works. It says in the book, uh, uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 311, again the people of God were reminded of the sacred obligation of the Sabbath. Yearly feasts were appointed, in which God's people were to gather together, and it was for their moral good. How can this ceremony point to the Sabbath without having the taste of the Sabbath in it? And so when you read Leviticus 23, you see the word Sabbath, Sabbath, Sabbath. So when Jesus died, are we trying to tell ourselves that Jesus nailed all of these Sabbaths to the cross? All of this rest, all of this blessing that he's pouring out upon his people. Is he nailing all of this to the cross? I'm feeling a bit ripped off if that's the case. And you have to ask yourself the question in Numbers 28 and 29. Why are there different measures of flour and oil for the different sacrifices at different times of the year? People that say that everything finished at the cross cannot answer the reason for that question. It doesn't make any sense. Just like, oh, well, we've just got to keep them busy until Jesus comes. Keep them doing something. Does that... you understand what I'm saying? So, this is, this is my contention that the... the uh, the message of Samuel Snow in 1844 provided to God's people a calendar which would light the path all the way to the city to provide the wise virgins the oil necessary to receive the seal of God. Because what does it say? Second Testimonies, uh, page 704, God is looking, the angels are looking for those who have a strictly devotional frame of mind to bring them light and health and strength through the Sabbath principle. And what else does the Sabbath more fully mean? We, we, we looked at this the other night, Exodus chapter 5. Those who, where Moses uh, was said, if we don't keep this feast, there'll be famine, sword, and pestilence that fall upon us. Ellen White says, those who preach the Sabbath more fully are protected from sword, famine, and pestilence. I, I think the connections are there, and they're pretty, pretty strong. And so, 
I invite you to step into the, into the Sabbath fountain. There's one more thing that I want to share with you, and I, I feel that it's, it's important that I just testify about this principle, because the principles of the book uh, Identity Wars, the relational value system, and all the things that we've written in there, I looked back at the timing of when this information was given. It was in 2001, and it was September 28 of 2000. September 29 of 2001. It was a seventh day Sabbath during a seventh year and it was the day after the Day of Atonement. Seventh month, seventh year, seventh day. That's when the identity message came out. And it came out two weeks after 9-11. Is that a coincidence? This is just something that I... I'm pondering about, because where did this message come from? Because it's the identity message that has led me on everything that's been from that point forward. So, um, we are told in the spirit of prophecy, and I have the quote in the book, The Sabbath Fountain, and maybe I can read it to you, that's of interest. Um... How comes the word that I have declared that New York is to be swept away by a tidal wave? This I have never said. I have said, as I looked at the great buildings going up there, story after story, what terrible scenes will take place when the Lord shall arise to shake terribly the earth. Then the words of Revelation 18, 1 to 3 will be fulfilled. And she goes on to say, I have no light in regard to what's coming on New York, only I know that one day the great buildings there will be thrown down by the turning and overturning of God's power. So when the great buildings in New York are thrown down, then the fourth angel's message will begin. Are you familiar with that quote? Review and Herald, July 5, 1906. 1906. Revelation 18, 1 to 3 is the fourth angel's message. It says, when the towers in New York... The great towers in New York come down, then the fourth angel will begin. That's what it says. Interesting how she says the turning and overturning. The turning and overturning of God's power. Yeah. God punishing sin with sin. Is that of interest to you? And as I've looked at major parts of the messages that have come to me, I was completely unaware of these appointments. The book Divine Pattern. Where does the principle of the Divine Pattern come from? Source channel as a mechanism for reading all of the scripture and everything around you. That book began to be written on the Feast of Trumpets. And it was written right through until the beginning of the Feast of Tabernacles in 2011. Is that a coincidence? Maybe it is. But that's when it happened. Uh, As a warning to fear God and give glory to Him. I'm just sharing these points for you to think about. Uh, I'm not fully understanding what it means, but I've certainly had a blessing learning these things. Uh, And uh, the danger of saying these things is that uh, I bear witness of myself. My witness means nothing. It's completely irrelevant. But you need to know the information. You can make up your own mind whether this is connected to the fourth angel's message, whether it's significant in terms of us receiving the seal of God. It's one thing I know for sure, that when there's an alignment, this is a On the earth, when there's an alignment of sun and moon with the earth, what happens to the tides? When there's a new moon or a full moon, what happens to the tide? There's a greater tide on the earth. If you were to align the Sabbath of the the week with the Sabbath of the month and you put them together, you're going to get a greater movement of water on, on the earth. Is God trying to tell us something? I've tested this principle. We tested it here in, uh, in 2013, down in Jasper, where we, we had a blessing. We did the blessing principle with the seventh day Sabbath during the Feast of Tabernacles. For those of you that were there will remember what happened. Uh, it was a tremendous experience, but it was a great blessing that, uh, that took place. Do these things happen by coincidence? I've been testing it for a number of years now. It's not a coincidence, not in my experience. So I commend to you the Sabbath fountain. Learn to number by sevens. Look for the appointments that God has given us and uh, receive the the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your patience. (laughs) Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, 
We just thank you for the seal of God, the Sabbath. We thank you for the calendar that you sent through Samuel Snow. We thank you that you sent Jones and Wagner to break the deadlock of the Augustinian dispensational principles of the covenant so that we can see that there is an everlasting gospel, that you are the same yesterday, today and forever, that you gave these appointments to pour out your spirit, to pour out the water, as it says in Ezekiel 46, that you will open the, the gates of the temple on the Sabbath and on the new moon, and that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh gather before me. For some of us, these things are strange because we weren't raised with the idea of new moons and other things. It seems completely ridiculous. But Father, help us to overcome our prejudice and to study and be Berean about these things that we may receive all the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.